name is Kent Dix, CEO of Light365, <clears throat> and welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of The New Normal. Today we will be uh, talking about moving the hospital to home, tech challenges, and opportunities. Before I introduce our panelists, I do want to take a minute and thank all the healthcare providers, first responders, school teachers, family caregivers, vaccinators, and many others helping us through the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you all for your service. I also wanted to let you know that everyone will be on mute and that we'll accept questions via chat and we'll try to entertain a few questions throughout the webinar. Today's webinar will be posted on light365.health website or www.newnormal.buzz tomorrow, along with the audio being available on Apple, Amazon, Google Podcasts, and many of your favorite podcast sites. <clears throat> now, I want to take a minute and introduce, introduce you to our distinguished panelists. First is Dr. Dave Albert, Chief Medical Officer and founder of AliveCore. Dr. Albert uh, is an MD, a, a MD as a physician, inventor, and serial entrepreneur who has developed life-saving technologies and products over the last 30 years. He is the founder and CMO of AliveCore, the global leader in FDA-cleared personal ECG technology and services. That's probably the shortest bio I've had for somebody uh, for somebody with your uh, your uh, thinking uh, or uh, your pedigree from that. And the next person is Tom Hall, Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder for Affirm XH. Thomas Hall has over 18 years in accelerating company growth through teams and technology. As a classically trained marketer from Johnson & Johnson, Thomas applied those learnings across uh, the J&J Diabetes franchise before leaving to grow Dexcom, a continuous glucose monitoring company from 18 million to 500 million in revenue. In this role, Thomas created business functions across the organization in digital marketing, business intelligence, and IT project management. He also led the commercialization of the first remote monitoring continuous glucose monitor. Subsequently, Thomas worked for a small marketing and management consulting company, serving for both startup and established companies to drive growth. Currently, Thomas is the CEO of Affirm XH, a pre-revenue continuous biosensor company. Thomas earned his MBA from the University of Texas and his undergraduate degree from the University of Notre Dame. And finally, we have Rick Bente, president of operations for 7th Sense Biosystems. Rick joined 7th Sense Bio in 2019, bringing a strong background in the design, development, and commercialization of disruptive wearable uh, medical devices. With 20 years of product development experience and more than 50 granted US patents in the wearable medical device space, he has held a range of leadership roles in R&D, marketing, and business development. Most recently, Rick held the role of Vice President of Strategic Alliances at Inslet uh, Corporation, where he led strategic partnering and collaboration for the world's largest wearable insulin pump company. Before joining Inslet, he spent six years at Unilife, uh, establishing and scaling the business of novel pre-filled pre wearable injectors for pharmaceutical customers, and eight years at Medtronic Diabetes, designing, developing, and commercializing insulin pump. Rick received a BS in engineering from Harvard Mudd, Harvey Mudd uh, College, an MS in mechanical engineering from UCLA, UCLA and an MBA from UCLA's Anderson School of Management. Okay, so an impressive you know, group of panelists and, and I really wanna focus on today, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had White Plains on uh, the, uh, some clinicians and administrative individuals that talked about moving the hospital to the home. Uh, in a few weeks from now in, in May, we're gonna have consumers on talking about adapting to technology at home uh, to be able to use it from a hospital at home and, and using telehealth to communicate with their doctors. <clears throat> Today, I wanna take it from the technology side, the opportunities and challenge from that side. So, you know, Dr. Albert, I wanted to take a minute to welcome you to the program. And I wanted to start off by asking you to describe the thought it took to design a product like the Cardia Mobile by a live core. I know you said it just didn't pop out and go to market, right? Um, so maybe first describe the history and thought behind the Cardia Mobile and the design consideration for consumers uh, that have used it and for providers as well. Because I know I see several things that are out there. I see patches, 
that are EC, uh, EKGs. And I also see people that are using multi-lead devices as well. So maybe just to describe the Cardio Mobile. Sure. Well, thank you, Kent, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, I would tell you that that uh, the idea for what eventually became a live core in Cardio Mobile was an idea I had back in the mid 1990s when I was uh, working in a company I'd started that ultimately was sold to GE Healthcare, a company called Data Critical. And we built a prototype, we got a 510K, that is we got it through the FDA, but it wasn't practical. It had a cell phone with a cable and a modem and a PCM CIA card, if you remember what that is, mm -hmm. and a portable computer. And it was, it was a kludge, but it was a, a concept. And the concept was very simple, that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And I wanted to take a straight line in an information sense between a patient and a cardiologist and connect the vital information needed for that cardiologist to help that patient uh, take it directly to that person. So that was the idea. And then came 2007. Now, you know, smartphones are the remote control for our lives. And that's true on a global basis, not just in the US, but all over the world, both developed and developing world. And therefore, I saw the opportunity to, to utilize the connectivity and power of a smartphone uh, to implement my idea from the 1990s. And, and that was the genesis for a live core. And uh, you know, as I mentioned before we started, it's really an overnight success 10 years in the making because when I started a live core in, in 2011, uh, you know, people like John Nasta and, and Eric Topol said, I'm the old man of digital health. Well, that's right, because back then people told me, well, first of all, nobody over 65 has a smartphone. Well, now we all do because that's how we look at the pictures of our grandchildren, okay? So we all know how to do that. And so, you know, the world evolved and as it did, and as the adoption of that technology, comfort with apps evolved, so did the adoption of Cardia. And, and so today, you know, we literally have, have over a million devices out there, hundreds of thousands of customers and over a hundred million ECGs in our cloud database and wow. utilized by, you know, Mayo Clinic is an investor, Qualcomm is an investor, Omron is an investor and our technology is used by every major medical center almost in the world. So from our perspective, you know, it was overnight success that took 130 peer reviewed cardiology publications to, to bring to fruition. So, you know, I, I tell all the wannabe entrepreneurs out there, persistence and patience are the two most important things you can have. Yeah, I get it. So how did you, how did you get to this form factor, right? From the, got I know to that you... form factor, that's our, that's our new Cardio Mobile 6L, which has been out, oh, just about a, 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 a you know, a year and a half. And of course, most of the time it's been out, we've been in a pandemic. This form factor came about because, um, because 100 years ago, a gentleman named Wilhelm Eindhoven won the Nobel Prize in 1924 for the invention of the electric cardiograph. And if you go on Google and you Google Eindhoven, you'll find this huge machine with a man sitting in a chair with uh, two hands and a, and a left leg, left foot in buckets of salt water. Those were his electrodes. And that formed what we call Eindhoven's Triangle. Well, when we first had Cardio Mobile, we had only lead one of that, the left arm minus the right arm. But by the addition of this bottom lead, which you touch to the left leg, we actually have now the implementation of the original Eindhoven's electrocardiograph. And so we're able to have a hundred years of knowledge as to what that means in various conditions and put it in the pocket of almost anyone anywhere for a very reasonable price. And, uh, and so it, it, it enables patients to acquire and cardiologists to assess many more conditions with far more accuracy than our original device. Uh, and, and so we continue to, to innovate. And that's kind of the heart of a live core is continuous innovation. That's awesome. I'm gonna come back to you about consumer usage and professional as well. But you know, Tom, I wanna to go over to you really quickly. And you're the CEO of um, Affirm XH, and just could kind of describe a little bit what Affirm is doing and your your thoughts about being at home and outside the point of care. 
Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Um, so with Affirm XH, we're a, a continuous biosensor company. And having come from the background of the diabetes space, much, much like Rick, um, our, our paths have crossed it at uh, competing companies and partner companies and whatnot. Um, what I think the big insight that I learned from coming from the diabetes space is how much of the patient self-engagement is important. Um, so when I look at, at what we're doing on a firm station, we're looking at uh, continuous metrics, we're looking at non-invasive metrics. So things like uh, temperature, heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, what we found is that the consumer engagement's important and the ease of use is important. And so the more we can <clears throat> take away you know, even taking, you know, my smartphone right here and saying, hey, I need a pair of Bluetooth. How do we get products that are prepared within Bluetooth? How do we start um, minimizing, taking that journey of consumers from the purchase to the unboxing, to the reimbursement, to the, um, how do you get the data out of the system? How do you share the data? How do you collapse all that so that it becomes um, it becomes transparent, it becomes as easy as looking at the kids, uh, you know, Dr. Albert, of your, of your grandkids on your phone. How do we make it that simple? Um, and so with that, part of, part of what we're focusing on at Firm XH is knowing things like recharging. You know, I take my, my watch and my watch died the other day and I had it on my wrist for about a day and a half where every time I look at it, I'd go, oh, my watch has died. So then I take it off and I put it on the charger and it sits on the charger for, it takes about an hour to charge and it sits on the charger for another day and a half. And then I take it off the charger, put it next to my bedside and I'm sitting there without my watch on, without it taking my pulse and all those metrics for three, four five days at a time. And then at the same time, I look at it and I go, okay, so I've got, you know, a Garmin watch, which is, you know, it's, it's on the lower end of the expensive on the Garmin side, but then you take your Apple watches, you take your Aurora rings, you take all of these technologies that have phenomenal metrics, but the reality is they're not accessible to everybody. You know, I'm not going to buy an Apple Watch for, I have five kids now. I'm not going to buy it for five kids. I'm not going to drop two, three thousand bucks to get everybody monitoring. So I think the affordability is the other piece. So within our company, it, it's looking at, at what is the consumer behavior in terms of how are people going to use it? It comes down to, to crazy simplicity um, in both how we capture the data, as well as once you're, once you're in that use state, how do you continue that use state for as long as possible without an interruption? Yeah, it's interesting. I think that you and, uh, and uh, Dr. Albert, you know, and LiveCore have kind of figured out a usability and human factor thing in this as well. Like, you know, the AliveCore has, has a small battery in it that lasts for forever, right? You know, yeah. from that perspective. It seems like it doesn't last forever, but it'll last a long time, um, you know? And so the senior is not having, or the person using it is not having to charge a, a watch or charge this and charge, you know, the phone at the same time, they're just worried about really their phone, their central heart. That's what they're worried about. You know, with your device that you've got as well, the reason why I was attracted to it, you've got a little tiny sensor uh, that will go through and do heart rate and heart rate variability and, and do movement. And it'll actually give early warning signs of infection potentially, but it lasts on a coin cell, you know, for six months. I mean, now nobody's going to wear a sensor on their shoulder for six months, but if you can take the recharging factor out of that and be able to spit the data back to a to an analytic or AI system or do AI on, on the edge, I think that's incredibly powerful. So why don't you talk a little bit about you know your the intended use of the Affirm X8 biosensor? Yeah, so uh, the for, our form factor, and this is sort of a, a prototype of the form factor, in um, it's it's designed really around not being a choking hazard because we saw the need with with COVID initially, we saw the a need for you know how do we start getting affordable sensing out there, and after looking at market research, really uh, tapping in initially to the the pediatric market. Um, in that, you know, the use case of, you know, you have a parent that's, you know, in the middle of the night, their kids got 101 temperature. They don't know if the fever's broken. They don't want to wake up. They don't want to get the kid out of bed. They don't want to take that temperature. Um, and so how do you, how do you ease that burden of it? Um, and that's the initial use case that we're looking at. And what we found is that then there's 
a very easy extrapolation from that to some of this remote monitoring in-home health within the elderly. In that a lot of the use cases, when I start looking at, you know, monitoring for, you know, my parents as they get older, is it, it's a very similar use case. Now the distance may be further, they don't live two doors down. But that sense of, I need to be able to check on them, the sense that I, I need to know if they're okay without having to nag them, without having to bother them. Um, it's a very similar use case uh, for both ends of that, of that uh, both child and, and elderly population. I gotta I got tell you, when my parents were both in assisted living going through COVID-19 this last year, uh, it was very, very helpful. I gave them both a pulse oximeter and I gave them you know, a thermometer, you know, Bluetooth thermometer. Uh, to be able to check them and the family could go in and actually see if they're doing okay or not, you know, from, you know, just by them taking a, a reading means that they're engaged. I wasn't even looking initially at the reading. I was just looking to see if they're doing it uh, to see if they're engaged in the process. But we actually caught mom's SpO2 going down to 75% one time, right, from that. And that scared us from a COVID perspective to have something that is very, very small that we could monitor her from a distance, uh, surveil her from a distance without being, I always talk about, without being creepy, uh, we're engaged in her care. Uh, you, you've got to be, you've got, you've got to be, you know, it comes off wrong. You've got to be very, uh, you know, responsible with the data, right, from that perspective. Uh, but it would have been phenomenal for us to be able to use during COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. Rick, uh, let me go to you really quickly, because this is, you know, Maybe one thing that some people understand, some people may not understand, but I want to introduce you from you know, Seven Sense Biosystems. Um, why I was really enthralled with your company is, you know, my last company that was acquired by a rapid diagnostic company, I know that rapid diagnostics are going to be going home, right, from that. And I know part of the, the issue with, you know, getting blood panels and blood draws and especially doing, you know, clinical trials at home and stuff, you know, we may have this connected data coming in from Dr. Albert's system. We may have data coming in from a firm XH in the clinical trial. And they may go through and say, oh, something's not quite right. You know, I need to get a blood draw on you. And you go, go to your nearest doctor and get a blood draw or your nearest lab. And then a week later, they get the draw and the events already occurred, right? Yeah. So Rick, why don't you describe a little bit about, you know, what Seventh uh, Sense does? Sure, yeah, and thanks again for having me today, Ken. So yeah, so Seven Sense Biosystem has developed a, a number of different tools for patients to self-collect capillary blood at home to use in high-end diagnostic solutions in laboratories. So we, we create a link between patients in their homes collecting you know, when they want, when it's convenient for them, or when it's necessary per a, a protocol or part of a clinical trial, and then get that sample back to the standard diagnostic equipment that physicians and providers are used to using today. And that allows patients and those providers and the researchers to get access to that critical type of information in the way that they're used to getting it. And it adds a, a layer of convenience for patients and a protection to keep them from needing to go out necessarily and expose themselves or their families to the access to that laboratory. Um, so I know, we, I know yeah, you probably ahead. have. I know you probably have one. Do you? Do you have? I a... do. Yep. So, so this is our our first generation tap device. This has uh, been FDA cleared for the collection of capillary blood for use in HbA one C monitoring. So, and uh, Tom and I both come from the world of diabetes, uh, and I think Kent, the last time you and I spoke, you know, I've seen just a, a tremendous explosion in the opportunities to improve patient care through the advent of data, through remote monitoring. I mean, the work that Tom did at Dexcom, that's a, a life-changing technology for people with diabetes. And the ability to get that data, to get it from patients in their homes, up into the system, viewed by doctors, viewed by patients, so that action can be taken to that contextualized data. That's the real key to unlocking improvements in health going forward. And I, you know, I, I live with a, spouse with type one. And so I see it every single day, the opportunities that come from that additional piece of data. And what, what we've done at Seven Sense is identify that there are other types of analytes, other places um, in the diagnostic spectrum where we can apply that same kind of opportunity and learning to other disease states. And so we're exploring a lot of different ways to uh, ensure that patients can have simple contextualized access to their data 
using the best in class diagnostic equipment that's out there. So where are you, where are you starting with it, with you guys, as far as uh, implementation? Yeah, so our, we currently have our HbA1c product here in the US. We just recently got our CE mark uh, in Europe. So across Europe, we're now commercializing our second generation product, which collects an additional volume of sample and allows you to perform a number of different panels uh, in both the clinical chemistry space and immunoassay. And we're specifically looking at uh, elements of the COVID-19 antibody space, where we can help in determining the effectiveness of vaccines, large-scale clinical research, and overall zero surveillance uh, for populations. I, I gotta tell you, when I talk to people, you know, we, we, we know rapid diagnostics used to be simple, you know, single arrays, you know, and they typically were done at the point of care of the doctor's office. A lot of them moved uh, potentially to the pharmacist site. And then we started getting multi-arrays right out uh, from that uh, perspective. There's companies that are doing that. Um, but, you know, some of the tests that are out there, creatinine levels, BMP levels, and other things that are that need to have, you know, blood draw, need to have, you know, substantially more, more blood and venous draw, blood at that. Um, so it's, it's, it's hardening to me that actually, I think the clinical trial people in the pharmaceutical would be, would be all over you uh, from this because, you know, if they can get a blood draw and start uh, getting markers and, uh, and events, uh, when events are occurring, in the home, I think it just changes the dynamic of care. I just, I just do right from it. So kudos yeah, to you. No I think question. You're, kudos to you. I think you're on top of something really cool. Uh, so on your uh, on on it, you've got a little vial that comes. Uh, yeah. With so it. the the second generation device delivers a sample back in a standard microcapillary container, and so yeah. that allows us to use existing laboratory infrastructure, existing laboratory tests that process full blood serum or plasma, you know, and deliver diagnostic results. In the U.S., that's still under development, uh, but in Europe, we just just got our CE mark for that product here. Awesome. Hey, Dr. Albert, I'm going to switch back to you really quickly. Um, I'm really, you know, as I move through this, I really want to talk about, you know, consumer adoption and also, you know, professional or, or provider adoption as well. You know, a, a little bit of background from my perspective. I mean, one of my friends, older friends, you know, uh, has AFib. Um, and, uh, he's, you know, he's getting up in age a little bit. I think he's, you know, probably 80, probably 80 years old. Um, but he has a smartphone, he has a tablet. And the first thing I recommend is we just go get the six lead for him, uh, to be able to do that. And he already had a close relationship with this cardiologist and the cardiologist would he'd email the report to the cardiologist. And then he'd call the cardiologist to see if he got the report, uh, from that as well. So, you know, how are cardiologists kind of dealing with new data coming in from outside the point of care? Well, it, you know, interesting you say that. Nine years ago, I provided a few devices to the University of California, San Francisco, and the chief of cardiology there is a guy named Dr. Jeff Olgan, a very well-respected cardiac electrophysiologist. And he called me to his office. So I went down to the mission office there at UCSF, and I sat in his office and he looked at me and said, Dave, I gave one of your devices to one of my patients. And he sent me 25 ECGs the first day. <laughs> and I said, Jeff, you and I both have a problem. Uh, you need to train your people, educate them as to how to use this. And I need to help you better manage the data. And we've, we've moved a long way since then. We have a platform called Cardio Pro. That's a portal that allows you to have all the data for an individual patient stored. You, they, they don't have to you know, email it. They don't have to fax it. It's there. You can tell the ones that have been reviewed, the ones that haven't. And, and places like, for instance, Cleveland Clinic has published a number of papers uh, on the use of that for, for longitudinal follow-up of cardiac patients. And obviously, over the last year, when televisits and virtual visits became the norm, not just something you did for patients that lived far away, it became very useful. I, I would tell you that, that you know, it also involves AI. We've, we have a continuous effort to improve our, our AI, to improve our sensitivity and specificity. And, and, and so all of that will come together because doctors cannot have a data deluge. You can't bring in six months of Fitbit and Cardia data and weights and, and SpO2. They need to have that dis, that, all that data distilled into some insights. And that's where AI is gonna come in and then obviously that data needs to be integrated into the electronic medical record. And, you know, tongue in cheek, we have an epic data sharing problem in the United States. 
and and that has to be resolved. And you know, it may take the uh, uh, literally an act of Congress to resolve that. But but you know, your record belongs to the patient, should move with the patient, should not be dependent upon you went to this health system or this doctor. And when you want to go to somebody else, you've got to get, you know, got to pay them for a big stack of, of faxed papers. That's ridiculous in 2020. Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, things are moving in the right direction. They're never as fast as we would like, but they're moving in the right direction. And I think ultimately, you know, the combination of AI and interoperability will enable physicians and other caregivers to have a better insight about your condition on a longitudinal out of the hospital basis. Again, you see your doctor for maybe 30 minutes in a year, two 15 minute encounters, maybe. And the rest of the time they're outside unless they get acutely ill. And so, you know, how do they check on your progress, especially if something happens, if there's a change? And I think that's where we're going to see wearables, continuous monitors become important. And then what you talked about, hospital at home. I mean, I look forward to getting into that because that, you know, CMS has brought up the whole notion of hospital at home. And in COVID, you know, the last place I really wanted to be was in the hospital. Yeah. You know, we have in medicine, we have this notion of Sutton's law. Willie Sutton was a bank robber in the 30s. And they asked him, well, why did you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Right. Well, the problem is that's where the COVID was, it was in the hospitals. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, you know, we're going to see a movement and pushed by people like CMS who have the power of the purse to push the hospital at home and all of these telemonitoring, remote monitoring, continuous monitoring functions will be important uh, for that effort. Yeah, and just to say, we've, we've taken kind of a broader approach uh, with what we're doing now that if we're going to embrace hospital at home, which we are, uh, it just can't be connected technology. It's got to be all the services that you would provide, you know, in the hospital have got to be at home. That could be transportation, that could be teleconsults, that could be food, right, that's out there as well uh, to be able to do that. I think CMS, you know, last time, you know, we checked, CMS had like only approved like 105 to 110 companies so far on hospital at home because they need to be able to have solutions that be able that are, can uh, can uh, provide a platform of services to home right to do that. But I want to ask you, we'll stay on you really quickly about the AI side of it. Um, you know, it's interesting when we worked with a very large health system, um, the doctors weren't as trusting in data that was being interpreted up front from AI for them. Uh, from that standpoint, maybe they're getting better at it now. The other thing that they're really concerned about is at the end of the day, they didn't want to see any more data. I agree with them on that. Um, their inboxes already have 500 emails in it by the end of the day. And they spend on average, I think Mayo Clinic was saying on average, they spend 80 minutes per night uh, just updating the electronic health record, right, from that. So how trusting are they with the AI? Well, I, I, they are skeptical, but understand the skepticism. You know, the old notion was is that AI was going to replace radiologists. The truth of the matter is AI doesn't mean artificial intelligence to medicine. It means augmented intelligence. Yeah. So radiologists who embrace AI will become more efficient and will replace those who do not. And yeah. so you're right. They are skeptical because they've seen things. I mean, in, in my area in cardiology and electrocardiography, we've had automatic computer interpretations for 50 years. And people have routinely decided that, oh, by the way, they make a lot of mistakes. Yes, they do. And by the way, deep neural, deep neural networks make mistakes and can be biased. It's getting better. It is a continuum. And I think what you'll see is, is that young physicians like my oldest son, this 31-year-old faculty member at Cedar sinai is a digital native. And he embraces the opportunities that remote monitoring, mobile computing, digital health, and AI will help him be more efficient, take care of more patients and help him. By the way, you spend 15 minutes with a patient, you then spend 30 minutes documenting that. Yeah. That's the problem we face today that has to be uh, improved with, with technology. We have to help the physicians not simply either A, need scribes, 
or B, have to sit in front of a keyboard uh, with their carpal tunnel. Sounds like another startup opportunity out there, right? So not for me. Solving it. There you go. I get it. <laughs> um, so Tom, uh, from your perspective and a firm XH, um, data, right? From that, obviously, part of the reason why you're putting the sensor, a large reason why you're putting the sensor on the shoulder is to get data. By the way, Rick, you know, blood draw is about data as well, right? From that. Absolutely. So how are you using data, you know, going forward? Yeah, I, you know, it's a, <clears throat> there's sort of this, uh, this weird sort of push and pull, I feel, where, um, you know, we're talking about doctors and, and EHRs, and there was a study that showed that doctors spend over just about half their time interfacing with an EHR um, during patient visits or, or in the, the continuum of the patient visit. And at the same time, if you look at the continuum of all data in EHRs and EMRs, only about 5% is being used. And so I sit here in a position where I go, hey, I'm going to generate a continuous stream of data that's just going to, you know, further make that problem worse. Um, it, and I think the the key behind it is is how it, it is how do we use the algorithms and how do we make the doctors um, not necessarily make more decisions but interpret more of the outliers. Um, you know, if I think of of AI um, among a graph, like we can plot. This is the known data set. Among that known data set, doctors aren't going to add a whole lot more to the algorithms. Outside, on the outer bounds of that, they're going to add a ton. And, and I think there's a, a piece where it's how do we get the data in a, in a way that the algorithms can use and can churn on. I think AI is a part of that. I think it's, it's looking at how do we start interpreting and looking at new data pieces. Um, you know, things like a, like a heart rate variability where there's not, uh, there's indications, there's studies that show that there is correlation with infection, but there's not a standard way of measuring it. There's not a standard way of interpreting it. Um, and then I think it's also going to be layering on further data that's the environmental data. You know, if all of a sudden I realize, you know, in Austin, Texas, where I live, the pollen is really high and I didn't sleep well, and combine that with my, my heart rate. And all of a sudden you start painting this more holistic picture of who is the consumer and who is that patient that um, I, I think it paints, paints a more realistic picture of what is the situation that I am as a consumer and as a patient, then I have an individual acute problem that needs to be fixed. And then that starts pushing the whole continuum more to preventative care. Um, so I, I I think when I look at what are we doing with data and how are we hoping to solve the data problem, um, one is we're collecting more data, but we're collecting data with a purpose in how we're going to feed our algorithms that data, not so we can just give a big chart to a doctor that says, here's a big chart that, you know, if you sign two things on notes, it means you've reviewed it. Um, it it's more about the interpretation of, of the data than just, you know, vomiting data into an EMR. And that's why I, I love the partnership between all three of you, because, you know, we're about, you know, not creating the science, as I always say it. We're about aggregating the data on a, on a common platform so that we yeah. can, you know, see that longitudinal view, right, yeah. of the patient uh, and get it to where it needs to go. The doctor doesn't need to see it. I always say the doctors need more data, but the AI system, the analytics systems do. They need a bunch of data and they need to not see it disparately. They need to see it across the complete view, right, to yeah. do it. So Rick, from your perspective, you know, from a data, you know, perspective, um, you've talked about a little bit about, you know, Seven Says Bio and, you know, the solution that you put together for blood draws, but you said customers are also asking for other data in correlation to that blood draw as well. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So a, a big part of where we see the world headed is sort of contextualizing that data and giving patients a view towards how their data is shifting over time. And we talk about the sort of longitudinal data concept. You know, we think that's really important because within even a given reference range, if you're shifting up or down over time, that may be meaningful to you individually as a patient, even if you're still sort of well within the normal scope of the broader sort of slice of humanity. And so we think the ability to, to both source samples to generate that data, 
at a bunch of different points in time, make that simple and easy. We'll also drive additional data points to sort of serve that holistic view of patient care and give patients information that's actionable far enough in advance so that they can actually make changes. And ultimately, you know, I've, I've seen from the diabetes space, and I think a lot of others here have seen, if you can give people early warning, if you can help engage them in their own results, you can show them the trajectory that they're on, you can have people make different choices in their daily lives that have pretty dramatic impacts on the actual sort of health and the future health of, of themselves. If you think about sort of health as a from a, a security standpoint, you're thinking about making sure that you're protecting yourself long-term. You're building sort of the, the protective pieces into your own daily life. And to do that, you need access to information that's gonna tell you about what it is you need to do or what you need to change. It's interesting. I always uh, talk about from my approach of two tiers of data. Uh, and exception-based processing. There could be a one tier of data that could just be using simple off-the-shelf devices uh, and getting consumer-grade data that the only person that sees it, not even the consumer, uh, is AI that sees it, right? You're comparing you to you, right, from that perspective. And if you need, if it sees a trend that's out of pattern, maybe it then goes and uses something that's a little bit you know, more sophisticated to get data that can be shared with clinicians and be able to look at those trendings instead. But to be able, I always draw this hump that shows we need to get in the middle and not wait till people are very complex care and different varieties of data out there can help us get to a mass population of people uh, and have it driven by AI. So we've got, you know, we've got a, a little bit of time left, but Dr. Albert, I wanted to swing back to you as well and just talk to about the whole hospital at home concept. In your thinking about this, now it's emerging with CMS, What's your thoughts on hospital at home? What, what needs to be put in place to have a successful program by a health system? First of all, there are people who have been admitted to hospitals that didn't need to be admitted to hospitals that could be cared for at home. But why are they admitted? Because a physician, maybe in the emergency room, maybe a primary care physician, believes that their acuity, their disease acuity is such that they should be in, in the hospital. So what I think hospital at home needs and and speaks to all three of our companies is the ability to on a real time continuous basis assess acuity because there will be times you're not gonna get a stent put in in your living room. You're not gonna have bypass surgery in your bathroom, okay? You're not gonna have a colonoscopy uh, in the, but so when you get to a certain level of acuity, you, Oftentimes patients will be just fine and will recover at home. But if you get a certain level of acuity, then you need to go to the hospital. So this is the notion that, you know, sometimes people are kept overnight in the emergency room for a variety of reasons, to rule out their heart, whatever. And they're under some type of surveillance. Well, what if we could do that with the appropriate patients in their home? And they're, you know, we're, we're trying to find out, are they really infected? Do they have sepsis? Do they need, because all, you know, you can get IV antibiotics at home. You can get supplemental oxygen at home. So you can get a certain level of therapy at home. You can get dialysis at home. And so I think what we need to do is make sure we have a regular, you know, in the hospital, you get your vital signs done, what, four times a day. But the reality is we need continuous assessment of acuity in order to have a safe implementation of hospital at home. And that's where the kinds of technologies from all three of our companies comes to play, it's assessing that patient acuity. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I'm seeing that, you know, the marketplace kind of evolve. I call them, well, I have a bingo board out there that shows all these companies that are kind of consolidating together. But you've seen the Teladocs and Lavongos, and you've seen, you know, the American Wells with United Healthcare. You've seen the Amazons with Transparent, you know, announcing, uh, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 channels that are channels that are dedicated to try to keep people out of expensive location, which is the hospital to do that. And the interesting model that I look at is the transparent model. I think they went out and purchased, you know, 300 surgery centers, right, that are out there, to your point. And they'll put a model out there similar to Mercy Virtual, 
uh, which allows them to be mainly virtual, you know, out in the community. But if they do need surgery, if they do need colonoscopy, if they need, need you know, in, inpatient you know, hemodialysis or whatever, they can provide those functions and ancillary sites but they're not building a billion dollar brick and mortar hospital anymore campus that's out there. They're building smaller campuses. And so do you think that trend is the trend to come and thinking as far as as distributed, you know, kind of centers of care, right, that are out there? I think think if economics are driving it and, and the payers, whoever the risk bearers are, be it a, you know, look at a Kaiser Permanente, vertically integrated. They own the practices, the doctors, the hospitals, the rehab, everything, and see how they're doing it. They're, they're you know, I, I doubt that they see building lots more big brick and mortar hospitals. They see a lot more clinics, you know, urgent care type environments. You certainly see that with Minute Clinics and Walmart and Amazon. And so I think you you will see a, dis, a more distributed healthcare situation. And in that case, hospital at home makes sense if you can deliver all of the services needed, therapeutic and diagnostic, and maintain that vigilance on the patient to know when to hold them and when to fold them, you know, when to when to walk away and when to run to the emergency yeah. room. So that I think is is key. Most of the individuals I talk to that are, are getting into that channel, that you know, that cost avoidance channel, are basically saying we're going to go to a pay provider, you know, kind of relationship. We're going to cut the middle, you know, the middle layer out of this completely altogether, and working, we're going to control the level of care that goes to our patient population, uh, disintermediate, disintermediate everybody else that's out of the equation, and make sure they go to the right specialist. If they have that much control over it, they can cut forty to fifty percent out of the cost. That's the, what they're thinking is right to be able well, to. Do I mean, it. you've got companies like Grand Rounds and others that are focused on being the shepherd and shepherding patients to the right people in order to to seek obviously quality and efficiency. Yeah, and they just got uh, merged or bought by Doctors on Demand, right? So uh, they're. they're they're on one of the bingo cards, right? The, of these alignments yeah. that are occurring out there as well. Guys, we have a few more minutes uh, to go, maybe about four or five minutes. But Tom, I wanna go over to, to you as well. Your thoughts you know, in implementing in a hospital at home scenario. Obviously, Dr. Albert, I'm not gonna speak for you, but your product is very um, adaptable, right? And designed to be at home, to be by a user and to be used by a physician that is remote, right, from that. so. You pioneered this years ago, right? From from that concept. Remember, Ken, pioneers are people who have arrows in their backs. No, I know I'm a settler, by the way, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be. You're a settler as well. So anyway, um, so Tom, you know, from that perspective, what's your your thinking as far as your solution? It can be used at home by a consumer. You know, I don't want to put any numbers on it. A third grade level consumer that's out there can use your your solution at home uh, and and the data coming in would be respected by the physician on the other end. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, and you were talking about the the hospital at home in terms of cutting out intermediaries. And I think that is is one aspect that I do think is, is happening and going to. I think the other aspect is how do we drive more of the, I'll say the wellness back to the, the patient themselves. Um, and I, I think it's in a couple of, two different ways I'm thinking specifically. One is establishing what is, what is healthy? Like, what is your normal? Yeah. Um, when I you know, look at temperature, I know from day to day, temperature can swing you know, a degree or two, from person to person, a degree or two. So all of a sudden you have these uh, sort of stacked errors when you look at you know, what is your population. Um, so I think one piece of it is for consumers to know when they, am I healthy, so that they can then know when am I not healthy? When do I need to start escalating that, uh, raising that bar, whether it's the consumer directly or through the algorithms. Um, and then I think the other piece of it is, um, is looking at the, the, the person-to-person variability. Um, so looking at that, and I think you get this with the continuous stream, is you can start to see what are my dips and humps in what is that variability and the variation Um, among myself to then determine, okay, when are all of the things starting to get out of balance? When is that 
that equilibrium that I can I call well or I call healthy? When is that equilibrium starting to tip out of balance so that I can catch it before it starts going to a place where I say, crud, I need to go to the hospital. Um, and, and I think that's the other place where I see that there is, is huge gains within the, uh, the health economics of, of what's going to drive um, the hospital to the home. I get you. So Rick, um, final question uh, from this right. perspective. Um, your thoughts on hospital at home, you know, from that and, you know, who do you partner with, you know, from that perspective? Um, I, really quickly, do the labs like you or not like you right, from that? <laughs> Well, one of the things we can do is provide an alternate source of samples. So I think when you think about hospital at home and, and all of the opportunities that I think it, Dr. Albert and Tom are presenting, you know, they provide data directly back. But one of the challenges, you know, sort of in that continuum of care is there's a lot of data locked up in your blood. You know, it's one of the richest yep. sources of information that's out there today. And we have a tremendous history, hundreds of years of effort in the science of understanding what does your blood tell you. And the way we see it is we can provide a link, again, between those patients and those laboratories. So we don't need to reinvent the science that's been out there on how to do diagnostics, how to do them at scale, how to do them efficiently and accurately. We just need to ensure that people can get those samples to those labs. So from that perspective, I think the laboratories see this as an opportunity to get access to additional samples to provide additional services back to patients. And I think providers ultimately, if you think about sort of how much of a provider's decision-making criteria comes from diagnostic sources and, and blood-based diagnostics in particular, it's a, it's a majority of the decisions that you're making from a healthcare perspective that are based on those types of diagnostics. And so for us, so, and I think yeah. when we think about hospital at home, you know, we're the perfect kind of solution to enable patients to stay at home and have the same hospital quality care and the same hospital quality diagnostics delivered to them and to their care partners. And then you can move patients into the hospital when they need to. And it allows you to deploy resources efficiently. You know, let's make sure patients who are in the hospital and who need to be there get the absolute best care and patients who are at home are getting the best access to diagnostics and information and the care pathway but that we're not moving them into the hospital unnecessarily. And I think there's a lot of studies out there about you know, how well patients recover in the home versus in hospital. And I think we and, and everyone here on this call can, can play a role in helping keep people in their homes and out of hospitals when they don't need to be and only moving them there you know, when it's really necessary. Hand, hands down, studies have showed that people do much better at home right? yeah. that, instead of being in, in the hospital itself. And I think a good partner for you Right now, especially the stage you're at, is you know a diabetes, you know a glucose, you know monitoring company that's out there that can send data and match it up with your data in the back end. So, you know, yeah, uh, I think it's a great partner. Um, okay, well, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank you know everybody for attending this afternoon. I want to take a minute to thank our distinguished panelists, Dr. David Albert and Tom, you know Hall and Rick Vente for your participation. Great insights into moving the hospital home, tech challenges and opportunities. I know we just, you know, scratched a surf the surface on here. We could probably listen to these guys for hours uh, from that. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all questions tonight, but we will post the video on Light 365 Health and www.newnormal.buzz website, as well as your favorite podcast site. Uh, please be safe and healthy. And we'll be off next week, uh, but we'll be back on April 28th at 1 p.m. Uh, part time, uh, Pacific time, sorry, with our um, next new normal webinar. The FCC has just re announced releasing $250 million uh, for COVID-19 telehealth programs. And we've got some experts that are gonna be on talking about how to try to submit a successful proposal and try to get people start start using uh, remote technology um, at home. So uh, have a great afternoon and thank everybody for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, guys. Thanks.